Good day, everyone. It is noon Eastern time, so I'm going to start. My name is David Taylor. I'm the Vice President of Research for the ALS Society of Canada. Thank you for joining us for the Global ALS Clinical Trials Update today. A um, couple of things just to preface. This is going to be a quick one. I've got one hour to go through these, but we are going to take time for questions. So if you do have questions um, and we are getting low on time for the hour, uh, there will be something on the last slide that will help to provide an opportunity for everyone to get their questions answered. A uh, couple other things. Note that I am a PhD, and often these webinars around clinical trials are given by MDs. Uh, and so, as with everything, uh, I ask you, whenever you hear something from anybody, you're feel free to go out and um, see, see what others think uh, about particular trials. Um, and I'm sure in a lot of cases, uh, the answers and the um, messages will be the same. But uh, just to note that off the, off the bat. The other thing I really wanted to mention is, you know, we don't have time to do justice for a lot of these clinical trials today, because as you'll see, there's so many to talk about, uh, which is an amazing and good thing. Um, but just for those who are wondering, uh, you know, what's happening in clinical trials and maybe feeling like, um, certain groups are not uh, thinking of them or, or or are really thinking about the end goal of getting to treatments for people living with ALS. I would say that in the years that I have been in this role and been fortunate to be a, a, the VP of research here, I've never met anyone in industry who is in a regulatory body, Health Canada, FDA, uh, an academic uh, working on ALS or anyone who works in a society with ALS who wouldn't love to be out of a job focused on something else because we can get to real treatments. And if there was something anywhere that we knew of that truly worked, we would do what we can to try to get it to you. And, and the world is adapting and we will get to places that are even better for, for people with clinical trials and to find new ways to be able to test them. So um, without further ado, we're gonna move forward. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually a, uh, a replacement for last year's part two of ALS clinical trials. This was a two-parter that I gave last year. The first one being sort of the ins and outs of clinical trials. Uh, what, how are they designed? How are they measured? A lot of those nuts and bolts. So that is still reasonably relevant. So we ask you if you're interested in those things to go back to our website, have a look at part one after this, and then this would be a supplement to part two, giving a 2020 sort of update. And again, if there are any questions that are in there that are not covered, please let us know because we want to make sure that it's current. We want to make sure people are getting the answers that they need. So today, as I said, we are short on time. We have one hour to get through what is an amazing load of clinical trials, and we're going to really focus on the ones that are sort of coming soon in terms of results and answers uh, that we hope. Uh, we're going to give a little more detail on those ones. Then I'm going to focus a little bit more, probably fairly quickly, uh, and high level on some other important or notable ones for various reasons, uh, as you can see here. But the crazy thing, and if I were to put some strange James Bond title on this webinar, um, I call it an hour is not enough because this is an unprecedented time for ALS trials and I've been giving these webinars for a number of years and never have I had a slide where I had so much trouble to fit the number of clinical trials that are currently moving forward and clinical developments that are happening for ALS. And the ones that I've even highlighted in green are probably ones that we're not doing justice to because they deserve their own slides, uh, as all of them do, but ones that we already have enough information to have a robust discussion about. So if you have questions about any of these in particular, there may be even a couple missing in there. Um, certainly uh, uh, feel free to connect with us out offline afterwards, uh, and we're happy to discuss any one of them. <clears throat> so the last thing I want to say before I get into the actual trials that are happening um, is that any one of those 50 plus ones on the last slide could be the next treatment for ALS. So just because we're not focusing on them does not mean that they're not important and not potentially successful for this disease. Um, a great example of that is that in 2013, 14, and 15, when I gave clinical trials webinars, there wasn't a lot of talk about a Darvone, but it was happening in Japan. And now we know that this is 
actually an approved treatment for ALS in a lot of countries, a uh, number of countries. And so some of those ones that you just saw on the last slide might end up being very prominent ones in the near future. So I'm going to start with one that I think is, is a good way to start, which is tofersin, is a, a, uh, a treatment by Biogen. And for each one of these, we're going to go through them in sort of a pragmatic order of what are they, what's happening with the trial, what do we know, and any additional information that you might need to know or find interesting. So the first thing is that tofersin is what's called an antisense oligonucleotide. And we won't get into much detail of that other than to say that our cells, including our motor neurons, uh, function by having a series of things in them called proteins. And those proteins are encoded by our DNA. And in ALS, the very first genetic mutation that we learned of in 1993 that could cause ALS was something called SOD1. And it produces a protein that is found in all the cells of our body. And what we learned over the years is that SOD1 is toxic and it has these mutations. And that if you reduce the amount of SOD1, this can actually have a protective effect on cells in the laboratory and in animal models. So this was the idea coming forward for tofersin and the idea of this antisense oligonucleotide that could stop the production of the SOD1 protein and reduce its levels. And so this is actually a phase, uh, now a phase three clinical trial. It started actually as a phase one clinical trial and the same trial has now been expanded all the way to phase three because of the promising data and the ability to potentially accelerate this towards getting a viable answer as to whether it works. It is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. We'll talk a lot about that in this uh, webinar. Uh, this basically means that the individuals who are participating and those physicians that are measuring uh, how, how they are uh, progressing in the trial are both blinded to whether or not they're on placebo or on the active treatment. And this is something that even the individuals who are on the trial in phase one have been given the active treatment after they've completed the 28-week assessment. Um, all the way through to today, which is a, something called an open label extension that you'll also hear about. Um, and so this has been provided for those individuals uh, for quite a, a number of years now and continues for the phase three for those who complete the assessment period. It is delivered through the spinal fluid. So in this case, it's something called intrathecal delivery or through a lumbar puncture. Uh, and that is deemed to be the best way for these ASOs to be able to get into our central nervous system. Where is it happening? It's happening at the US, UK, Europe, Canada, there's a site that can deliver it now in Australia, um, and it is uh, basically in, in many, many areas around the world. So what do we know so far about tofersin? Um, it has very promising phase one data, but I will really preface uh, or uh, follow that up by saying it is short duration, and it was very small in the data that we have so far, which is why we need to be able to test this further to be able to see if it actually has an effect. Um, so this is from a poster that you can find on the Biogen website, which has sort of the first 85 days of data from their phase one trial. And one of the things, if you just sort of use some white here to block this out, you can really kind of see why this is promising, at least from the phase one data, in that even the, the dotted line here and the dotted line in the red shows that fast progressing people with ALS, at least over that time period, appeared to be relatively stabilized. Now, what makes this unique versus perhaps other ones is that it has pretty strong biomarker targets. And that ultimately tells us whether or not the, the effect is coming uh, in relationship to something that's actually biologically happening. First one, NFL, which is not shown here, um, is a marker that is evolving in terms of neuronal damage. And what they found is that when the people were treated with tofersin in these early stages, there was in fact a, uh, a reduction in the NFL um, that was found in the cerebral spinal fluid. And a, a very big interest is that the SOD1, which you would need to want to see it be reduced by this, because that's what the therapy is actually targeting, the red line here shows that at the 100 milligram dose, there was a decrease in the levels of SOD1 in the cerebral spinal fluid, again saying that at least it's hitting its target. And so that gives some biological emphasis as to why we may be seeing an effect. Now, what else do we need to know? Well, this is probably the most talked about trial by clinicians and researchers. Um, anecdotally, what people are saying is that people who are even on the phase one trial who continue under the open label phase seem to be doing quite well. And um, many years later, even for those individuals who typically uh, would progress quite quickly with the disease. So that's very intriguing. But again, something we really need to be careful about, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in this webinar, is that in ALS for many times, both 
um, uh, at the clinician level, the, the researcher level, and the participant level, um, we have been fooled by smaller trials that have low statistical value. Uh, they're what we call underpowered and that we just don't have enough evidence to determine if they work. And a great example of this happened in the early 2010s. Uh, there was a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled trial of a, a drug by Biogen called Dexpremipexol, in which the researchers had quite a bit of excitement around the fact that it seemed to show that there was a significant slowing of the disease. And then when a larger phase three clinical trial happened and it appeared that uh, it, it no longer worked. Now, this also necessitates us looking into the heterogeneity of the disease to, to determine if some people actually may have responded to this in the future, but um, or for each uh, drug that we test in the future. But again, it tells us that we have to be very cautious about interpreting data from small clinical trials uh, that aren't uh, um, um, really giving us a definitive answer about a drug. Now, understanding that most of the people out there probably are not affected by SOD1 mutations in the audience, it is true that this only affects a small proportion of ALS cases, but the concept certainly could affect a much larger group. And so ASOs actually are something that are already targeting other uh, proteins, um, particularly uh, knocking down the, the genetic cause of, of C9OR72 mutations. Uh, this is uh, the most prominent genetic mutation in ALS, both found in familial forms and sporadic individuals, some sporadic individuals, um, so those who don't have a family history. Also, uh, uh, a target called ataxin 2 is going to be starting soon by Biogen and Ionis uh, together, uh, which is a, a particular genetic mutation which can uh, confer some susceptibility in people who do not have family histories as well. This says that what we can start to do is using these ASOs potentially to target multiple different genetic uh, uh, targets um, that are specific to ALS but may not necessarily need someone to have a family history. And that's very exciting. And this is really paving the way for genetic targeting therapies in ALS, um, which will be the future for a lot of, uh, of ALS or a subset of ALS treatments, including uh, ones that use something called an adeno-associated virus. So there's a company called Voyager, another one at Vexis that will have something coming soon. Um, also, uh, Pfizer and Sangamma will be working on something called zinc finger transcription factors. All of these ways in which we can potentially target specific genetic uh, uh, targets in, in ALS. So very exciting, but again, we, we will have to wait and see in the next year or so uh, how this all pans out with Pilferson. The next one I'm gonna talk about is one that I think uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with. Uh, this is Brainstorm's Neurone. Um, I cannot do this one justice uh, in the short amount of time that we have, but I will try to go through this in the same way as I did with Tofurton. And so essentially, what is this? It's a stem cell-based therapy where um, uh, cells called mesenchymal stem cells are removed from the bone marrow of an individual. These are then cultured very carefully and treated with a, uh, a substance called Neurone. Uh, that is in, intended to boost the uh, uh, supportive capabilities of those cells to help motor neurons survive longer and healthier. Uh, they are then re-injected into the spinal fluid. So again, just like uh, uh, tofersin, into the cerebral spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture or interthecal delivery. And then the idea is to measure whether or not this has a supportive effect on the motor neurons. Now, uh, for the trial details, this is a phase three clinical trial. It's exciting to know that it should read out by the end of 2020, at least the top line data. Um, it's also exciting to know that it appears they have enrolled 261 participants. I believe originally it was 200 participants. This is great because it should give more statistical value to the results in the end. Um, and it's a 28 week assessment. And the, the difference this one between uh, previous brainstorm clinical trials is that they have done three injections over a period of time as opposed to the single injections that the previous trials have, have, uh, have used. Um, and where is this happening? This is happening at six sites in the United States. One of the things that we, we should give very strong kudos to the company for was noting uh, that Canadians really wanted to have access to this as well. Um, they did open this to uh, uh, Canadians at the risk of their trial to be able to go to those sites and be able to participate. Um, and also of note that these were in three specific areas in the United States. So even though it may sometimes feel as though Canadians were not getting access to this because we didn't have it here in Canada, there are also many areas in the United States that are heavily populated and didn't have it local to them as well. 
And with that, I'm going to actually jump to a very quick sidebar. And this was something that was asked by my colleagues to, to just mention in this, this clinical trial. And it's sort of mentioned in part one as well. But I think it's important um, here to kind of discuss, which is a question many people have, which is why is the trial that I'm interested in most most interested in not happening in my particular country. And for the, for the major reason, it's not because anyone doesn't want to have it there or that people haven't tried to have it there. It's usually a very pragmatic reason why it hasn't happened. And in the case of a company who is running a clinical trial or even an academic investigator, the biggest thing is that these are scientific experiments to try to understand if the therapy works and to get it done as fast, fast as possible. And so they have to figure out where to best hold their study to get that answer. Sometimes there's financial reasons for this. It could be a small company and they're not able to, af to afford to run it at multiple sites in multiple countries. Sometimes it's around recruitment ability. Certain sites are better at recruiting than others. And so um, there has to be taken into account with how much it costs and the time that it would take to recruit in uh, a smaller center. And then often it's regulatory reasons. Maybe a pre-established relationship exists already with the FDA or with the EMA in Europe, for example, and that could be why a, a, a trial would be run in those places. And really the goal of the company is to obtain enough proof of efficacy to be able to try to market the drug and to prove that it works and benefits ALS or the lack of so that they can stop putting R&D investment into something that's not actually gonna work and benefit people who are living with cancer. Um, often these are US and Europe because the FDA and EMA honestly are sensible business for the people who are backing the clinical trials and putting in the millions of dollars. And so for them to remain viable and to get a market so that they can then expand to other countries, often this will start in the United States and Europe. Um, and, and that's just um, unfortunately how it is um, uh, for uh, uh, the reality of it. Now for an academic, often it's determining what can they afford to get the correct answer. So sometimes something might be in just a few centers in one place, um, largely because they're maybe working on a grant that they have limited funding to be able to expand. Um, and so in most cases, I think everyone would love to be able to give it as widely as possible, um, but they really need to be able to get those answers so that they can potentially get a therapy to people as quickly as possible. And so from the Canadian example, two that we're often asked about, just to quickly kind of highlight these, um, uh, Brainstorm, for example, as I said, six sites in the US, they did open this up to Canadians. So this is a small company and they already had an established relationship with the FDA. It's not a simple process to set up and it's not simple to develop these relationships with new regulatory bodies um, for them to have wanted to run their trial as quickly and as efficiently as possible to see if it worked and get it to people with ALS. Um, and certainly in almost all of these cases, conversations happened in advance of the phase three clinical trial um, between the company, between uh, investigators in different countries, and ultimately, um, you know, what's chosen is chosen for, for reasons that are um, trying to think patient first uh, and trying to get the best uh, ultimate outcome as quickly as possible. In terms of the Healy platform trial, we'll talk about that uh, near the end. Um, this is another one we get asked about a lot. Um, this was one that's currently been approved through what's called a central REB or research ethics boards process in uh, uh, the United States, one that doesn't exist here in Canada. And for them to have a viable platform trial with a unique new design structure for ALS, um, it really needed this first sort of set, I would say first phase, I don't, don't want to confuse everyone, to happen in the United States. And, and I think before expanding to make sure that the foundation is solid. And, and certainly conversations again had happened between clinicians in Canada, um, ALS Canada, and those people involved in the Healy platform trial. Uh, in advance of the public asking about it, but those are not things that we would really widely publicize. But just to let people know that, you know, I really believe that everybody has the best interest at heart of the, the people living with ALS and the people affected by ALS. And although it doesn't always seem like it, in the end, uh, it really is something that, that in the background, people are doing everything they can. Okay, so I hate to separate that one because we're back to brainstorm and I think it's important that we talk about what do we know so far. So they did publish in a journal a few years ago about their first open label sets of treatments of 26 people who received the treatment. This gave enough of an indication of safety and potential efficacy to move on to a double blind placebo control trial. Quite a small one um, at 36 people treated and 12 placebos, but still enough to be able to show that there's a potential 
for uh, a slowing progression of disease. At a very short period of time, so two to four weeks, and then a little bit beyond that, they were able to show this. But again, this was a single dose of finerone, so we're hopeful that this would be something that pans out in a larger trial, measured over a longer period of time with multiple dosing. We don't know, but certainly this is something definitely worth trying in a phase three clinical trial, which they have been doing and will move forward on until the end of this year when it's finished. What else do we need to know? I mean, if we're just talking very frankly about this, this is definitely the most talked about trial by the public right now. We're very excited to, to get the results in late 2020 to find out whether this actually works or not. Hopefully we will be able to suss that out from the data that they get. Um, but just again to say, you know, um, in ALS, if, if it feels like uh, academics and clinicians and, and, and others are saying that we don't know yet what's happening with, with Brainstorm or with any of the therapies, it's because this is not new in ALS for us to have seen some individuals who may potentially be benefiting from the disease. And we don't know yet until we get a wider, more statistical evidence uh, if it works. Um, but the other thing I, I think is important to know is that uh, these stem cells are not aimed at replacing neurons. They are aimed at uh, providing support to the motor neurons. Um, and recent evidence, more work by uh, Brainstorm has actually shown that neuron may not only boost the, the potential to have factors that can support motor neurons called neurotrophic factors, but may also regulate the immune response in a positive way. So definitely very exciting, um, but we need to be able to uh, understand whether this is, is actually working or not. And, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we will continue with beta breath to see what happens. Moving on uh, to Orion Pharma, Levosimendin. What is this? This is something that's used for congestive heart failure. It increases uh, muscle contraction sensitivity. So again, as you can imagine, that as the neuronal signals, as the motor neurons degenerate and the signals from the brain to the muscles become weaker, if you can get those muscles responding more, uh, uh, more strongly to those weaker signals, this might be a benefit for people to preserve function for a longer period of time. So Orion's been, been uh, running this phase three clinical trial for a good size number of participants uh, for 48 week assessments. Uh, so quite a good, a robust trial to be able to determine hopefully later this year, whether it has an effect. Uh, it's been at a number of sites around the world. So that's great. Um, and the primary outcome here is what we call supine SVC. And this is a measure of whether or not the lung function is preserved for a longer period of time, particularly looking at uh, an ability to breathe uh, while laying down, which is called the supine measure of SVC. And so in this case, there's a reason for that. And that's because the phase two clinical trial showed that this supine SVC seemed to be preserved in a very short duration in those phase two, certainly enough to be able to uh, uh, determine uh, that they need to go to a larger phase three clinical trial and see whether or not this is preserved. While there was no effect on the other measures in that small trial, that doesn't mean that in the longer, more robust trial, there may not be something to see as well. So what else do we need to know? The results are expected to uh, uh, be, be uh, seen in 2020. And uh, ultimately, the only other thing is that pulmonary function test, which is these types of tests like SBC, uh, uh, slow vital capacity, uh, fast vital capacity, um, whether or not these are affected at all by COVID-19 and the fact that breathing in and out can be a potential source of transmission. There have been some clinics that have had difficulty getting these pulmonary function tests in, but all indications are that the Orient trial should be on track and we remain hopeful. And there's certainly adaptations that the, the entire field uh, um, is putting together to try to, uh, to uh, deal with these, this situation. The next one is one that um, in the past has probably been one of those ones that's been talked about a, a little later in the webinar, uh, largely because it was only in a phase two and it's called Amelix's AMX0035, but it is dumped up for a prominent reason that I'll uh, be happy to explain here. So uh, it's a, a fairly small and new company that we're running a trial called the Centaur study, where it's a combination of two drugs that have previously been tested in ALS called sodium phenylbutyrate. And I see I've spelled phenylbutyrate wrong there. Good time to find that. <laughs> uh, and Tudka, which I'm not going to pronounce for you because that will just be awkward. Because um, uh, I have trouble pronouncing it sometimes. But we'll get into a second why those are interesting uh, in the combination oral drug. Now, uh, the clinical trial details were a, a, a reasonable size, smaller phase two clinical trial of 132 participants, double blind, placebo controlled, well-designed trial, 
measured over about six months and was completed in 2019 with hopefully to learn about the results soon. And this was happening at 25 sites in the US. Now, why are we talking about this one? Well, based on what we know so far, there was a press release that came out in December from the company, which said that the primary measure of functional decline that's measured in most clinical trials called the ALS FRSR um, actually was slower in those individuals who were receiving the AMX0035. So that's very exciting. Um, we are awaiting more information and uh, I'll talk about that in just a second, but um, the basis for really where this comes from, sodium phenyl butyrate was a clinical trial in the late 2000s that was run. Uh, wasn't run in a huge robust clinical trial. It showed good safety, but uh, it wasn't moved forward into a, a, a later phase trial. Um, Kutka, on the other hand, so that, that trial there, Kutka, on the other hand, actually did show in a phase two trial that uh, there was some potential efficacy of Tutka, and in fact, enough so that um, the European platform trial, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, is actually studying Tutka alone um, as a clinical trial um, uh, for ALS in, unto itself. Now, uh, the data that the company has in terms of a com combination of the two seems to have shown that there was a, a, good, a good idea to run a clinical trial on a robust combination of the two, um, and uh, all, all signs are pointing towards this may have actually been right. So, what do we need to know now? Well, the company has indicated that they don't want to provide details until they have their data peer-reviewed in publication format. Part of this is because they have been really well-funded and stewarded by an academic community who has helped them to understand how to message things appropriately with regard to not providing false hope until they've had their data really well vetted by the academic community. And so uh, as soon as they're able, I'm sure they will release the news. And then we're very excited to find out whether this will move on to a phase three clinical trial or whether or not they've already applied or will apply to the FDA for approval uh, based on the data that they have. So very excited to see what will happen. But again, trying to be thoughtful, I think, in the way that they're presenting this um, so as not to put anything out until it's well vetted. So uh, the, the last one that we're going to talk about in a little more detail is Orphozyme's aramoclamol. What is this? It's actually something that stimulates a, a response that's found in all of our cells called the heat shock response. Remember, I talked about proteins being the important factors in our cells to do all of the functions that we need. Well, these proteins are folded in a certain way. They have a specific 3D shape. And when they're misfolded, this can really be bad for cells. So this treatment called aramoclamol was found back in 2003 that it can actually help motor neurons overcome their inability to do this heat shock response in an effective way. Uh, and so that's pretty exciting. And just to give you an example, in, in neurons and neurodegenerative diseases, you often see something similar to this laundry room where you've got all these misfolded, clumped up proteins, and that's not a very functional room. If these HSPs could work effectively, then they could fold all of those proteins, keep them in a happy and healthy situation, and provide a more functional environment. Um, and so that's what aramoclamol is, is designed to try to do. It is a phase three clinical trial of 231 participants. It's a long trial, 18 months, and set to read out in a, a 2021. Uh, where is this happening? It's happening at multinational sites, United States, Europe, and Canada. Uh, possibly other sites. It's 29 sites are listed, I believe, on clinical trials. So what do we know so far about aramoclamol? Uh, well, there was a phase two clinical trial that was run specifically in people who had SOD1 mutations, so familial ALS run by Dr. Michael Benatar in Miami, and what he led the trial. Um, and uh, it was a smaller trial, but it did actually trend towards an effect after 12 months. And you can see specifically here, in fact, that there seemed to be a, an interesting trend towards slowing the progression of the disease in fast progressing people living with ALS. That's Pretty exciting stuff as well, um, and definitely worth expanding into a larger trial. And for those of you who are wondering about why it would be switched to a sporadic ALS situation or those who aren't specifically SOD1 mutation carriers, in this case, um, this response, the heat shock response, would not be considered something um, that would be specific to SOD1, but in fact could be a general response to help with misfolded proteins and stress response within our motor neurons in a general sense. So what do we need to know? Just like Orion and Brainstorm, there seems to be some promising uh, earlier data that we need a more robust clinical trial to be able to read out. Um, and uh, we're very excited to find out what will happen with this as well. So in all three of those cases, 
um, it's exciting to know that there's a, a potential that any one of them could be a, a potential treatment for AMA. I'm going to go a little bit quicker now. We're into 30 minutes. Uh, I told you there's a lot to go through. And uh, um, if there are questions, certainly you can put them in the question box there. We will get to them for sure. Um, uh, possibly not within this hour, but we have a mechanism I'll tell you about at the end. So Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America and Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma uh, headquarters of Japan have been working on oral Adaravone for some time. Now, uh, we won't get into too much detail about Adaravone. I'm sure most of you have heard that this has actually been approved for use in ALS in several countries, Canada, South Korea, Japan, United States, uh, as Radicava or Radicut. Um, they're still trying to work out the exact mechanisms by which it might be protective, protective but um, it's probable that some portion of that is at least due to an antioxidant mechanism. Um, and currently it's an IV medication that is given using a regimen that was originally derived from stroke uh, use in Japan, so two weeks on and two weeks off. Now, uh, this first step with the oral Adaravone is really to then examine whether or not an oral suspension, which would obviously be easier to, uh, to take on a daily basis or on a regular basis, um, during the same regimen would be compared to whether or not it has a bioequivalence and ability to protect in the same way as the IV form does with the two weeks on and two weeks off. And this will be a multinational trial at many sites. What do we know so far? Well, we know that MT Pharma has been working on an oral formulation for, for quite a while. Uh, ever since they started to realize that this would be a valuable thing for ALS, it's certainly um, something that would be uh, a better um, uh, way to administer it for people living with ALS. Uh, and they've been doing some work on uh, how, it, how it works in the body as an oral form as compared to the IV form to date. Now, what else do we need to know? Tree Wave Therapeutics in the Netherlands is also testing an oral Adaravone called TW001. Um, so we can see how that moves forward as well. And that we can expect more to come in the days ahead with the study of oral Adaravone. So this is one of the first steps that will be taken, but certainly I think the company is very adamant that they want to make sure that they find the best way to be able to provide uh, any protective effects that, that uh, Adaravone can confer on people living with it. Another one is Cytokinex Rel Deceptive. What is this? This is sort of the culmination of uh, many years of work uh, by Cytokinetics on ALS. Um, and uh, this is another one like Orion in that in a different way, it increases the muscle's response to motor neuron outputs from the brain. Um, and this uh, Rel Deceptive is an improved version of something called Tiraceptive, which previously showed very promising results in a phase two, but had sort of poor to tolerance. And people who are on Tiraceptive would end up getting dizziness and nausea that could lead them to obviously, you know, not reap the benefits of the, the drug, need to drop out of trials, et cetera. Um, so uh, not, not uh, sorry, I apologize. I should not have said not reap the benefits of the drug, but in this sense, it could make it more difficult for them to take the drug. So rel deceptive cuts out some of that, that problem with the nausea and the dizziness. Um, and we're hopeful to see that move forward and find out what will happen. And there's so, more public for it has been talked about that there will be a phase three clinical trial. There's no further info that can be given to the public just yet, but I'm, I'm assuming in the, in the next several months we'll probably learn about that. And then based on what we know from their previous trial of Raldeceptive, it will probably be a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It's an oral capsule and presumably in the sites that they've been working with over the course of their clinical progression uh, to this point. Now, what do we know so far? Well, a tear receptive in a quite a large phase two clinical trial a number of years ago, in fact, showed a positive uh, 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 slowing of uh, vital capacity, so an improvement or a, a slowing of the lung dysfunction, um, and also uh, um, in muscle strength as well, in a trial called Benefit ALS. But due to that uh, uh, nausea and dizziness that I talked about and the tolerance of the drug, um, the phase three clinical tri trial actually wasn't able to get enough people to complete it to get enough statistical robustness to understand whether or not it was having a protective effect. Um, simultaneously with that phase three clinical trial, they were working on a smaller, shorter duration trial of rel deceptive to be able to test it for safety and to be able to see if there's any indication of efficacy. And there was a trend towards a potential effect, uh, but because it was short duration, it really needed this larger trial to be able to suss out whether or not it's having a positive effect. So exciting to see this come forward. Um, and the other thing to kind of note um, is that for something like Orion's uh, Levosmendin or Rel Deceptive, 
because they're targeting muscle and not the motor neurons and the cells surrounding it, the microglia, the astrocytes, et cetera, this might be a potentially good adjunct therapy that could be in combination with others, provide a, a better uh, treatment effect overall for people living with ALS if it were to work. Next two I'm gonna really talk about quickly are ones that I have to say we, we maybe wouldn't talk about um, in a webinar if these weren't something that were talked about already by those who are running the trial. And what I mean by that is um, uh, they're very early in their clinical development. We do not know a lot about whether they work or not, but they're very well known to the public. So we think it's important that we at least address them here and talk a little bit about them. First one is collaborative medicinal developments, copper ATSM. What is it? It's a synthetic copper drug that can deliver copper to molecules particularly uh, a prominent one in ALS is SOD1, uh, needs copper for its enzymatic activity. Um, uh, it is used uh, as what's called a PET imaging agent to bind to tumors so they can be visualized. Um, and we know that it can penetrate the blood-brain barrier very quickly, even if given in an oral form. So there is a phase two, three clinical trial happening in Australia. And that's where the company is located. Again, as I said, sometimes companies are small and, and trials are very expensive and this is where they can realistically hold their trial. Um, 80 participants, double blind, placebo controlled this time over about six months to be able to measure or not whether or not uh, a copper ATSM is having an effect on ALS. Now, what do we know so far? Um, based on the early evidence, it appears to be safe and tolerable. We do not have a peer-reviewed peer publication yet on the um, uh, any data beyond that. Uh, however, it has been uh, presented at different conferences, so we have been able to see this. It appears to be safe and tolerable. Um, it really does have intriguing free clinical data. There's no doubt about it. Um, ALS TDI, who runs massive screens of numbers over the years of, of, of ALS uh, potential treatments, found it as one of the few repeatable positive treatments in ALS mice. That's fantastic. Um, as well, there was a unique ALS mouse model that included both an SOD1 mutation and a copper chaperone mutation that had a very aggressive motor neuron disease um, that ended up getting severe rescue by copper ATSM supplementation. That was very intriguing data, again, with a model that we're not usually using in ALS, so it's hard to interpret that. However, definitely warrants looking at and being interested in. And even a study uh, done here in Canada by uh, uh, Dr. Krishan in Vancouver that looked at a, a, a lesser used motor neuron model um, and, and found that there was a significant effect of copper ATSM, that then leading it to more of a non-SOD1 potential um, as would be used in the particular trial, which is recruiting people widely with ALS that don't necessarily have the SOD1 mutations. Now, uh, just to hit this head on, um, there was a, dis, uh, a press release that came out after the phase one clinical trial that said this was a huge breakthrough. First human evidence for disease modifying drug and motor neuron disease, 70% slowing a disease. Um, this is probably why it's so widely known at this point. I think there are some key things we need to note about that. It was an open label trial, again, because everyone who was taking it knew they were on the drug and so did the physicians who were measuring it. Um, Historical controls were being used. This is something that we can talk about and has talked about in the part one of this webinar uh, in a little more detail, um, but you can choose which controls you're using and it's not exactly the best way to be able to measure uh, the effect of a particular treatment. And it was a very small number of individuals, so it's hard to be able to tell at this point. Now, certainly we hope it's real, but at this point, it's just a very difficult thing to be able to say anything at all other than it appears to be safe and tolerable. So I should probably not say no reason yet to know, for this to be so widely known, but I would say it's probably not yet at a point where we would want to say this is widely known because we just don't have enough evidence yet. Um, again, the trial is quite small, the new one, so it will probably need a large effect size to tell if it truly works. We hope that it will. And um, uh, that's no knock on the company at all because these are expensive trials. This is a small company, and I've said this before that that sometimes uh, you know you do what you can to try to get an answer, and and hopefully with this we will we'll see uh, a follow on of the results that were were alluded to in the phase one. But right now we just can't really say much. In terms of T regulatory transplant and stimulation, quite very quickly, what is it? These are specific cells that are circulating in our body, and that can have a very strong effect on uh, tamping down uh, negative immune responses that we have. 
Um, and obviously the one that is probably most widely known is by ALS legend Stana Pell, uh, who's been working in a preclinical sense on this for years and has really brought it translationally to the clinic where you are transplanting people's T cells after they're then pushed towards these T regulatory protective cells and then re, re uh, given to the individuals uh, to be able to see if they are actually working. And he's currently in a phase two clinical trial with 12 participants. Um, it's a very expensive study. That's why it's quite small at this point. They're still assessing whether this is safe over, by giving um, the uh, T regs every four weeks over the period of a longer period of time. But um, uh, and at two sites in Houston and Boston, and we'll get into the evidence of this just in, in a moment. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, another one, just so you don't get too confused, there is another one out there that is starting up in a phase one clinical trial um, by a company called Rapid Therapeutics, where they're also um, treating with a T cell type that is trying to be driven towards a T regulatory uh, type cell. Um, so again, this is something that's being uh, 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 mined in other ways by other uh, um, clinical trials. And even uh, another trial, which is set to read out a little earlier, is a phase two clinical trial of giving what's called a low dose of something called interleukin-2. Now, interleukin-2 helps to drive the T cells towards a T regulatory uh, type and can help maintain T regulatory cells into that protective type. Um, so uh, low dose IL-2 had been given in smaller trials before and hadn't shown anything, but in this case, hopefully with a larger trial, it might potentially show something. This is a great collaboration between the France and the UK um, to really look at some of the similar type pathways. So what do we know so far? Really does have good preclinical data. Um, it seems a number of people have been able to associate that uh, a reduced number of Tregs are associated with uh, a faster progression in ALS and, and higher Tregs with, with uh, longer survival. Um, and that the Tregs in people with ALS seem to be less effective at their job um, than they are in people who are uh, uh, not with ALS. So it does give good impetus to be able to do this trial for sure. Um, I urge anyone who has um, uh, heard the soundbite about uh, the stabilization to go to the actual peer-reviewed publication. It does show promising data for sure, but it's in a very small number of people. Again, three individuals, one of them very slow progressing, um, over a short period of time that they did shows uh, during the Treg infusions, open label again, that there seemed to be some stabilization. And that's what this hopeful new one, which is longer with more infusions, will be able to start to suss out, even though it's really uh, powered up for safety. But exciting things, but really at this point, extremely difficult to tell at all if this would work or will work, um, but we're very hopeful. Um, the other thing is we don't know about a lot yet about some of these. Other people probably do. The sites that are actually running the rapid therapeutics trial, I'm um, hopefully to learn more about those uh, soon enough. Uh, the MIRACALS trial is set to finish in 2021, and those aren't even the limit to ones that are actually focusing on Tregs as a potential uh, avenue for treatment. Uh, Revelazio's uh, RNS60, which some people are calling the bubble trial, with these nanobubbles, uh, one of the readouts there is that it can increase T, uh, T regulatory cell uh, levels, and it has been shown in mouse models to do the same thing. And also an MS drug called Tecfidera, which is being run out of Australia in an academic trial, uh, has also been shown to increase deregulatory cells. There's a lot of things that will ultimately determine whether or not this is the avenue that we want to go, but certainly promising and exciting, um, but too early to tell on all avenues. Quickly now, Alexion's uh, Rebulizumab, uh, or Altamiris, is a trial that will be happening in phase three, so it's important to mention. Um, this is one that's really focused on a general immune and inflammatory uh, uh, pathway called the complement system, particularly the last set in the system, a, a very prominent one called complement factor five. Uh, this will be a large phase three clinical trial. We can talk about it in more detail another time, um, but is an IV infusion of an antibody called uh, Ultimiris or uh, Rebulizumab. Um, that will be at multiple sites in U.S. Canada and possibly others. What do we know so far? There's some evidence in the uh, preclinical data online uh, that, that can link C5 or complement factor 5 to ALS. But we assume that because um, industry is putting a large amount of effort into this, that they probably have other data that's unpublished. And uh, again, something we can talk about later. Um, 
another thing to really note here is for Canada, there will be Canadian sites on this trial. And uh, this is an identical target to one of the other drugs that are on the Healy platform, which we'll talk about in a second by Raw Pharmaceuticals, which is an oral inhibitor of C5 called Zalupoplan. And Elixis is AT 1501. Um, why am I talking about this one? Actually, I think it's important because, first of all, there's a lot of um, uh, people affected by ALS who are connected to ALS TDI, um, who have done a really great job over the years of connecting both the, uh, uh, the people who are affected by the disease and research together. Um, and this is a really great translational story, to be honest. Um, uh, this is uh, something that's targeting, again, a, a, a very prominent factor in, in harmful immune responses, particularly with what are called macrophages or microglia in ALS, which can have harmful effects on the uh, uh, motor neurons when they're not working properly in ALS. Um, it's a phase 2A clinical trial of 54 participants, double-blind placebo-controlled IV infusion. Uh, that will be happening in the United States. Now, what do we know so far and why am I highlighting this one? Well, um, they did do an initial study that demonstrated safety and tolerability. It's not published yet, but it has been reported. Um, and uh, what's great is that ALS TDI is something that has existed for a number of years, since 1999. Uh, and one of their big major goals was to take a whole bunch of therapies and test them very rigorously in mouse models over uh, uh, the, the whole decade and, uh, and now two decades that they've been doing this. And of all the ones that they tested, this was the one that they decided was obviously the most repeatable and robust effect that they had. So in terms of delaying onset and extending survival in ALS mouse models repeatedly, it was this uh, antibody to CD40 ligand. So that's quite exciting because um, not only will it be something that has pretty strong preclinical data, um, but it also help, will help to tell us eventually how uh, viable these um, mouse models that we use in, in ALS can be um, uh, towards uh, uh, being relevant to the clinical situation. But a very exciting one and uh, strong kudos to them for driving this forward all the way to a phase two clinical trial. Pimazide, something I'll talk about just very quickly here is a Canadian clinical trial uh, that comes from a collaborative uh, set of work in the laboratory here in Canada um, by uh, researchers in Quebec. Uh, that ultimately got elevated to clinical trial led by Dr. Lawrence Korngut in Calgary. Uh, this is an older drug that can still be used for Tourette syndrome, tics, et cetera, and uh, was funded through a Hudson grant by ourselves and Brain Canada in partnership to uh, recruit 100 participants. It's still recruiting at nine sites in Canada, so if you're interested in this and you want to see if you're eligible, have a look online at, at clinicaltrials.gov about it and contact them about potentially being recruited for this trial. Um, what do we know so far? A small phase two clinical trial appeared that it was safe and tolerable for people living with ALS and gave enough signal to warrant going forward with the, this current 100-person uh, clinical trial. Um, and uh, the original evidence from the preclinical data appeared to show that it may strengthen what's called the neuromuscular junction where the muscle meets the uh, motor neuron. And the other things to know, you can learn more about this one on our webinars in education. Dr. Korngut gave a couple of webinars for us about uh, of the trial. Um, and really that it is recommended not to take this off label unless you're under the, the overview of someone who's running the trial, uh, just to make sure that everything is safe uh, for a person living with ALS. Um, uh, it can be well managed when, when properly cared for, uh, but not recommended to take off label. And that's something that's mentioned in that webinar by Dr. Kornga. Last one before I get into the, the very brief bit, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll go quick, is Medici Novozibutilas. It's another one that is going into phase three clinical trial um, and uh, will be measured over 12 months. Uh, focus again on an anti-inflammatory type mechanism. Uh, again, there will be Canadian sites as well as other sites in the United States and probably other countries. Uh, what do we know so far? This has moved through and had promising enough data in a phase two clinical trial to suggest that it needed a more robust trial. They've also done a biomarker study in, in humans that they reported recently. Um, still trying to work out exactly what the mechanisms are, but there are a number of preclinical pieces of data that show that ibutilast could have multiple effects beyond the inflammatory uh, mechanisms that may be potentially uh, helpful in ALS. And we'll probably talk about this one more uh, in the future as the phase three one develops, the phase three trial develops. Now, the last little bit I just want to highlight here is that one of the biggest things in all of the field of ALS research over the past decade is the advancements in care put into making sure clinical trials are running half a fat faster um, uh, and more robustly and, and trying to get the better answers 
uh, things like biomarkers being added in to make sure it's having the effect it's supposed to have and seeing how we can reduce the amount of placebo while still getting a viable answer as quickly as possible. All of these things are being added in. And here you can see that uh, uh, globally, physicians got together to discuss and come up with a set of guidelines recently. And things have even evolved since these guidelines have been published because we are continuing to move forward. So platform trials for ALS is one of the cool new things that have come out in the past few years in terms of taking a, a structure that existed for other diseases, particularly where it's been successful in cancer trials, and applying this to ALS. And I'll use an analogy that Dr. Maritzkovich has used, so I'll steal this from her. And the idea is that clinical trials have very frequently been building a whole stadium to test one thing, to play one game, and then tearing them back down. And that takes a lot of time and money. And how can we start to develop stadiums where we play multiple games? So in the case of a platform trial, the idea is, can there multiple drugs be compared under the same framework in a very adaptable and flexible way so that you can replace one drug with another when one other fails or, or actually works and moves forward? So here's a, a generic example. You have five drugs in a particular platform trial. A person wants to enter. They don't choose which drug they want to be a part of, but they get randomized. So let's say this person gets randomized to drug two. They have a very high chance of being able to be on the experimental therapeutic and a lower chance that they would end up in the placebo end. And that is because the placebo is actually pooled. So they're able to compare placebos across the different drugs. So for example, if drug two then finishes and we want to have a readout of it, you will have say maybe 80 people who are actually on drug two, but you can pull the placebo from across the platform trial to be able to get better statistical, statistical understanding of whether or not drug two actually works. And then from this, you either will have enough evidence, hopefully, to move it forward to a larger trial or to actually be able to apply to FDA or Health Canada with the, if the data is very strong or to find out very quickly if it doesn't work so that we can move on to something else. And in that case, it's very flexible and then a new drug can actually be put right back in and continue on without having to rebuild the whole framework. Now, the one that's most talked about, the Healy ALS platform trial, um, this is uh, currently got five treatments, 54 US sites, 800 participants, um, and a lot of backing from the academic community um, uh, uh, led by Dr. Marit Sikovic and Dr. Sabrina Paganoni. Um, very interesting clinical trial. Again, not enough time to, to do it justice here, but we'll be able to talk about it more in the future. Um, is already in the process of either recruiting now or very, very close to doing so. I believe it is starting to recruit. And this is an example of the five drugs that are being put into that. Now, I don't have time to go through these, but again, the interesting thing is here that they were chosen by a, uh, a strong group of, of individuals, experts on ALS for ones that have a good safety profile, but also have um, varying targets that may have potential just as any others do uh, based on earlier studies to, uh, to potentially have an effect on ALS. And apparently there may even be a treatment number six, uh, I haven't seen in the last week or no whether or not that's yet been announced, but I think it, it's probably coming soon to announce uh, a, a yet another one to add on to the platform trial. Very quickly, there is also a European trial called Magnet Platform Trial. Um, this is led by the uh, TriCALS Initiative, which is the clinical trial arm of the European Network to Cure ALS, or NCALS, um, led by a number of very strong world-class investigators in Europe, six countries, as you can see, and they're actually testing two treatments to start on the platform trial. The first one is Triomec and HIV medication. Um, and this comes from the fact that there's some literature uh, that shows that there may be a reactivated retrovirus that can occur in some people living with ALS. It's a very complex situation in that some other people cannot find it, so we're still trying to suss that out. But in the meantime, this is being tested to see if it can actually have a slowing progression of, of ALS in this platform trial. The other one is actually really cool, and I wish we had more time to talk about it, um, is actually studying lithium carbonate. Someone may say, wait a second, I think we've tested that multiple times before in ALS, and that's true. But this actually comes from work uh, led by Dr. Michael Van Ness and a number of others uh, in a consortium in Europe uh, who have actually found that there could be potential genetic responders to treatments that we haven't found in the past. So by going back to old clinical trial data, looking at the participants to see if any of them had a specific genetic factor that might make them responders to a particular therapy. They found that in the old lithium carbonate trials, those who had a specific mutation for something called ONC13A conferred a faster progression on them, but those who were on the lithium carbonate actually did significantly better. And this has warranted them to actually put this into a clinical trial with a screening for those who have the ONC13A mutations. 
Finally, there's also a, a platform trial happening in Scotland and the UK called the SMART trial. They're working on two particular treatments. One's called Memantine. It's been tested a number of times in ALS, but not robustly enough as it will be here. Um, it is a, a treatment that's used for dementia. And trazodone, something that has a lot of interesting data for specific populations of ALS, although here it will be recruiting widely. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works. And I think the idea of the SMART platform is actually to recruit with a very low eligibility criteria um, or inclusion criteria to try to allow for people to have access to um, uh, uh, being involved in the trial as widely as possible. More to talk about this certainly in the future. Finally, I want to mention that there's a very valuable new resource that's available called 10 Red Flags. In part one of the webinar, I talk about ALS Untangled and the value to people of, of that uh, consortium of experts. Uh, they just published something that's really fantastic for those who are going and trying to figure out if something on the web is, uh, is real or whether it's a potential scam or anything like that. There, there are these 10 red flags, and it's a more robust article than this, but uh, certainly it helps to understand what are the things that you should be cautious about when you're looking at some of these glossy websites, for example, that promise a potential therapy. Um, and always asking your clinician is a great idea as well. So um, with that, you know, actually, before I get to that, I would just love to say I understand that we can't do justice to all of these. But at the same time, um, I also want to mention that you know, there's a lot of positive things going on and how we can continue to adapt to make sure that not only clinical trials are giving access to more people, that we're being thoughtful about how things are being approved and being studied. And there are a number of new potential pieces of legislation coming forward south of the border that could be very interesting. And we continue to try to adapt to find ways to both get robust answers as to whether something truly works maintain the way the system works so that we can work within it as effectively as possible and to get people access potentially as early as possible to anything that may be promising. And all of that is happening in the background by people who really do care about this and it's never going to be fast enough. I think we'll always know that, um, but we do want it to happen. We do want to find better ways to, to allow these clinical trials to happen and uh, um, if everyone works together and stays positive, I'm sure we will get there. And I can't wait for that day when we have a future without ALS. So uh, noting that we're really at the hour and I told you we'd race through this, I'm actually reaching out to say, um, since we don't have time for questions in this live environment, um, and I actually can't see the random questions that came in, what I'm gonna ask is that if anyone has specific questions, please email research at als.ca today or tomorrow We'll start with these two time slots. I am happy to go online. I will zip my mouth to start. I will let people talk and ask questions or discuss. And we can do a face-to-face -face call um, with whoever wants to be online um, asking your questions about that. Um, certainly, I'm not uh, going to have the only answer for things, but at least we can make sure that people have an answer to some of their questions. And if you can make it through the, these time slots, let us know. We'll figure out a time because it's important to us that no one's leaving here today or tomorrow or et cetera with questions that are left without some sort of answer. So I can't believe that's 59 minutes. I'm sure you can because I talk so much, but um, I appreciate everyone listening. Uh, I think we're going to cut it there because I've been told I have a hard stop at one hour, but please email us if you have further questions and we'll look at the questions that came in online and we'll try to connect with those individuals as well to see if they want to have a chat about them. Thank you so much. Wishing everyone a wonderful day and hope to see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.